Hello and welcome. Good morning. You're watching Market Cafe on ED now with me, Sneisha. And with me, as always, is Shreyanthi Singh. And what you just saw before we cut to the show were live visuals of Team India arriving at the New Delhi airport, making their way in their bus, being chased by a whole lot of fans. Everybody is ecstatic because the cup is where it belongs it's finally home after that uh, hurricane delay that we did see coming in uh, from uh, Barbados the team has uh, reached India finally and the cup is back home but uh, lots of fun uh, lined up today when it comes to Team India they'll be first meeting PM Modi then making their way to Mumbai where uh, I am very excited I'm going to be going to Marine Drive today to wave at them and to see uh, and to cheer for the team that has brought the cup home but before uh, before we talk about about more on that let's talk about uh, Herbalife because Herbalife India has recently launched the Vritti Life Outer Nutrition range which marks its entry into the luxury skincare market with an Ayurvedic based skincare line. We spoke with Managing Director Ajay Khanna to learn about the brand's expansion plans and its strategic vision for the future. Listen. Herbalife India proudly announced the launch of the Vritti Life Outer Nutrition range marking its entry into the Indian luxury skincare market. We have seen the success through the inner nutrition for the past, uh, you know, two decades, over two decades. Definitely the outer nutrition which is there through the skincare, you know, that will also add value to our overall, I would say, uh, contribution or overall uh, offerings which we are supposed to give to the uh, Indian uh, market. This new range includes a facial cleanser, facial toner, facial serum and moisturizer all developed at Herbalife's Center of Excellence in Bangalore. The unique thing about Herbalife uh, and Vritti Life is that we have our own Center of Excellence and R&D lab in Bangalore. And so all our products are clinically, dermatologically tested, developed, okay, and produced in India. So the biggest advantage is it's a ingrown product supported by uh, R&D, in-house R&D. We also have, uh, you know, a talented uh, Ayurveda doctors who are there with us, okay, uh, who, who are involved in the formulation of these products. Since 2009, Herbalife India has grown steadily, diversifying its product portfolio to include 48 products across the fitness, nutrition and health verticals. Well, opportunity is huge. India has been growing for the last uh, 15 years, year on year, a consistent growth. And we are also hopeful that, you know, with the support of our distributors, customers, uh, you know, we will continue to uh, deliver uh, a growth uh, this year also and in the future also. take coming in from the management of Herbalife but let's move on then and let's take a look at what the US markets did then and the S&P 500 rose to new highs in Wednesday's uh, shortened trading session now of course this is a truncated week coming in because of Independence Day holiday and uh, this is after that you know you did see investors appearing to shrug off uh, sluggish economic data when you take a look at the broad market index you're looking at uh, gains coming in of half a percent there and a close above 5,500 levels. Now, when you take a look at NASDAQ, then that saw an uptick of about 8 tenths of a percent, ending the session above the 18,000 levels. As mega caps, uh, tech names like uh, Tesla as well as tech darling uh, NVIDIA rallying. Now, uh, both indexes touched fresh all time highs in the session and closed at records as well. So, when I'm taking a look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, you're looking at gains coming in of about 1 tenth of a percent thereabout. And when you take a look at the 30 stock index as well, that was weighed down by a nearly 1.7% drop in United Health. Now, trading volume, when you look at it, is uh, was largely muted on account of that holiday, like I mentioned. Of course, it was a shorter day coming in on Wednesday as well, and the exchange will be shut on Thursday for Independence Day. Now, investors are also parsing through stats that were released on Wednesday morning, showing softening in the economy ahead of Friday's all-important June jobs report as well. Now, ADP data showed less private payroll growth than expected in June, while weekly jobless claims numbers came in higher than economists forecast as well. And with that, you also have coupled with that a reading of service sector activity released later in the morning that was considerably weaker than expected and also indicated a contraction coming in according to the 
Institute for Supply Management. So now these reports could concern investors about the state of the economy. But stocks found support from a decline in bond yields at this point as traders grew increasingly hopeful that the Federal Reserve has seen sufficient evidence of economic tightening to begin cutting interest rates as well. So that largely is the handover coming in from US. When you take a look at the European markets also, what you saw that what you saw is that uh, European stocks also closed higher. So that largely is the roundup coming in there, Sneha. Absolutely. And, you know, equities doing well globally is very clearly having an impact on our Nifty implied open as well. Because as of now, we're penciled to open up with a strong gap up opening of 100, like 175 points on a spot basis. Yesterday also, we were penciled in to open up higher, which we did. And the Nifty closed 7 tenths of a percent higher. Similar rally expected today. But let's move on, talk about what oil prices are doing and oil prices fell in early trade yesterday after US, uh, pardon me, this morning after US employment and business activity data came in weaker than expected in signs that the economy may be cooling in the world's top oil consuming nations. Now in the United States, data yesterday showed first time applications for US unemployment benefits increased last week while the number of people on jobless rolls rose further to a two and a half year high towards the end of June. Separately, the ADP employment report showed private payrolls increased by 150,000 jobs in June. We'll be telling you more about this. In a further sign of a loss of momentum in the economy, the ISM non-manufacturing index, which is a measure of the U.S. services sector activity, fell to a four-year low. And later in the show, we'll be giving you more details on this as well. Now, however, weaker economic data may add to the Fed Reserve's arguments to start cutting rates. Analysts said a move that would be supportive for the oil markets as lower rates could boost oil demand. On the back of uh, all of this data that we saw coming yesterday, let's take a look at where uh, what both of these indices are doing. Brent, uh, uh, Brent at $86.96 a barrel, almost at 87. Half a percent lower is where that index is right now. And you have WTI oil as well at 83.4, so almost 84, but has slipped below that $85 per barrel level and trading with half a percent uh, cuts as well. Moving on, let's also take a look at what gold prices are up to and gold prices have risen more than 1% to a near two-week high yesterday driven by an increased bets for a September interest rate cut by the Fed Reserve after we've seen all of this data coming in from the U.S. market. So gold at $2,369.5 uh, per ounce, uh, doing pretty well at a near two-week high like I mentioned. Well, uh, speaking of doing pretty well, you do have the Asian markets that are doing really well at this point. When you take a look at all of the markets, what you're seeing is an uptick coming in, especially as Japan's topics crossed its all-time high of 2,886. That was previously set in December 1989, so an important move coming in there, and the topics jumped about five-tenths of a percent thereabout. While the, uh, let's also take a look at Nikkei on your screens. That uh, saw an uptick of about three-tenths of a percent coming in there. And the Nikkei is less than 200 points from its all-time high. So currently, that is uh, the trade coming in when you look at the Japanese markets. Japanese companies have delivered the largest wage hikes in three decades this year, according to the nation's largest labor union. Now, monthly pay for union-backed workers will climb 5.1% on average this fiscal year, ending March 2025. And this is according to a survey of companies conducted since March by union group Rengo. Now, investors are also assessing Hong Kong business activity data released this morning as well and also await Australian trade numbers due later in the day. So, half a percent uptick coming in. There are currently about four tenths of a percent uptick coming in for Hang Seng. Let's also take a look at Shanghai then. That is also in the green. Not firmly so though because there's a two tenths of a percent uptick coming in for Shanghai as well. Let's also take a quick look at ASX 200 then. Uptick of over a percent coming in there as well. Kospi lastly is also in the green. Let's also take a look at exactly where that index is and that is up about eight tenths of a percent on your screens as well. Now, back home, we shut shop around the 24,200 levels. And what we're penciling in right now in terms of a spot basis is largely a good handover coming in. Uh, and because of that, we're penciling in a decent uptick, at least on a spot basis and even on a futures basis. It's definitely not a subdued start that we're penciling in at this point. In fact, it's a gap up start that we're penciling in this morning and gift nifty looking very confident on those numbers coming in and implying a very good and very strong open but let's talk about some global stories this morning let's begin our coverage for the day with the top headlines takeaways from the federal reserves june meeting remember minutes of this meeting were released late last night and central bank officials indicated that inflation is moving in the right direction but not quickly enough for them to start cutting rates just yet 
policy makers were of the view that more data driven confidence was needed to know if inflation was sustainably headed to that 2% target minutes reflected disagreement with some even indicating a penchant towards raising rates if necessary the meeting concluded with fomc voters holding rates in place additionally the committee largely left its economic projections intact though they lowered their inflation expectations for this year now the fed's dot plot continues to show one percentage point cut by the end of this year versus three indicated earlier this year this even as futures market it's continue to price in two uh, two cuts starting september moving on then business activity in the us service sector contracted in june with the pmi reading dropping to 48.8 from 53.8 in may this reading missed the expectation of 52.5 by a wide margin meanwhile private payroll growth edged lower in june according to a report from adp that indicates a potential slowdown in the us labor market Companies also added 150,000 jobs for the month below the upwardly revised 157,000 in May. The total was the lowest monthly gain since January as well. Moving on then, recent data on inflation and economic expansion reinforce arguments for additional interest rate reductions by the European Central Bank with two more this year about right, according to council member Yanis Chornanas. But even as uh, he backed the case for two more rate cuts, he said that policy would continue to be restrictive. All right then, let's take a look at the political landscape for British citizens who will be heading to polls today to vote in an early general election. The Labour Party is poised to win. According to several opinion polls, replacing the Conservative Party that has ruled Britain since 2010, if you look at the polls, it is pretty clear that Labour at this stage are heading for an extraordinary landslide on a scale that has probably never ever been seen in the country before and that is the word coming in from a, one of uh, PM Rishi Sunak's ministers as well. This, is made this would be made possible on the back of the Tories failing on several counts, including the cost of living crisis, health, as well as immigration crises, which loom large. Now, if indeed opinion polls turn out to be right, the Labour Party wins by a landslide majority. The big question is what implications will a change in government have for the UK's relations with India? We also caught up with Meera Shankar, former Indian ambassador to the US and Germany, and Ashok Sajjanhar, former ambassador, to get more insights on the same. Listen in to what they had to say as well. Now have a you know a roadmap which seeks to double trade by 2030. Uh, we have two-way trade of $40 billion, uh, almost. And um, uh, UK is uh, an important investment destination for Indian companies. You know, for instance, Tata has bought Jaguar, and there are many other investors from India who have made significant investments in the UK. Especially post-Brexit, I think the UK has been looking to strengthen its economic and strategic partnership with India. Uh, defense cooperation has not been as robust as it could have been, uh, but I think we are looking to step it up and also to look at new areas of technology, including artificial intelligence, semiconductors, quantum computing, and I think one UK company has said that they plan to invest some 30,000 crores in India's uh, uh, you know, project for building semiconductors in India. Let's see uh, how soon this investment materializes. Brexit has happened in 2020. So, you know, definitely the United Kingdom is looking at uh, partners, at important partners where it can uh, engage with. And uh, possibly there could be no better partner than uh, India at this uh, particular juncture. So I think whether it is the Tories or it is Labour, I think on the economic aspects, definitely India would be extremely attractive uh, for uh, the United Kingdom and vice versa. All right, all eyes are going to be on that UK election today and everything that happens regarding Rishi Sunak's party not expected to make a comeback. But on that note, viewers, we'll slip into a very short break on this edition of Market Cafe. We'll be right back with more news and updates. You stay tuned.
Welcome back. Thank you so much for staying tuned in. Well, let's get a move on and take a look at uh, the rest of the stories that we have on our list to cover. The central government constituted eight cabinet committees. It includes appointments committee of the cabinet, which features PM Modi and Home Minister Amit Shah. Other cabinet committees are accommodation, economic affairs, parliamentary affairs, political affairs, security, investment and growth, skill employment and livelihood. My colleague Prakash Priyadarshi filed this report earlier with more details. Take a look at what he had to say. The government has uh, constituted eight prominent cabinet committees today under different heads. So that will help government to take forward its business affairs. And the first committee that the government has constituted is uh, the appointment, uh, appointments committee of the cabinet, which will be chaired by the Prime Minister with Home Minister Amit Shah as a member, which will look after uh, all the important appointments in the government. Along with that, the government has also constituted a cabinet committee on accommodation, which will be, uh, uh, which will be joined by the Home Minister Amit Shah, uh, Pro Transport Minister Nitin Gadkari, Nirmala Sitaraman, Manohar Lal Khatta, the Power Minister, Piyush Goyal, the Commerce Minister. Along with that, the government has also constituted Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs, which is responsible for all the economic-related policies of the government, and that will be chaired by the Prime Minister himself uh, with uh, Rajna Singh, uh, the Defence Minister, and uh, Amit Shah, Home Minister Nitin Gadkari, Shiva Singh Chauhan, Nirmala Sitaraman, uh, S. Jashankar, S. T. Kumaraswamy, Piyush Goyal, Dhaman Padhan, Rajiv Ranjan Singh as a member. Uh, the government has also constituted the Cabinet Committee on Parliamentary Affairs, uh, along with the a cabinet committee on uh, political affairs with uh, different uh, ministers as a member. One important cabinet committee which was constituted by the government, that is cabinet committee on security, which is responsible for all the security related decisions uh, in the government, uh, in the country. That will be chaired by the prime minister with the defense minister Rajna Singh, home minister Amit Shah, finance minister Nimila Sitaraman, and the minister of external affairs S. J. Shankar as a member. Uh, when it comes to uh, a cabinet committee on investment, uh, which has also been constituted, a cabinet committee on investment and growth, again, it will be shared by the prime minister with the different minister as a member. Last but not the least, the government has also constituted cabinet committee on skill, employment and livelihood, which is responsible for all the decision and the policy related steps the government will take going forward when it comes to creation of new jobs, generation of uh, uh, edu uh, generation of employment. So th these uh, are the prominent cabinet committees uh, which have been uh, uh, constituted by the government today to take forward its uh, business affairs. Prakash, thanks so much for all of those details coming in. Let's move on. And the RBI governor has met uh, the MD and CEO of public and private banks. He's issue, uh, issued on the agenda. Uh, issues on the agenda include credit deposit, cyber security and digital fraud prevention. My colleague Ankur Mishra filed this report earlier. Listen in. Yes, as we reported here on ET Now, all important meeting between bankers as well as Reserve Bank of India was held in Mumbai. And in this meeting, the attendance was there from uh, private bankers as well as PSU banks. Uh, there were several discussions uh, which were brought out to notice uh, in the meeting, but uh, Reserve Bank of India did mention about uh, improvement in asset quality as well as uh, the profitability of the banks. But if you talk about important issues, persisting gap between credit and deposit growth, liquidity risk management and ALM related issues and also trends in unsecured retail lending was discussed in the meeting. Uh, now you remember that in the monetary policy, Reserve Bank of India governor gave a kind of warning to banks uh, as far as uh, credit deposit uh, growth is concerned and also uh, regarding the growth in unsecured lending after the steps which has already been taken by Reserve Bank of India. The discussion in the meeting also included cyber security, third party risk and digital frauds and also strengthening of assurance function of the banks. Uh, credit flows to MSMEs was also part of the discussion in the meeting and increasing the usage of Indian rupee for cross border transactions. Uh, was also discussed in the meeting which was held between bankers as well as Reserve Bank of India. All right, thanks Ankur for those details coming in. Let's uh, get a move on then and once considered an alternative to Twitter or even touted as the Twitter killer, the little yellow bird coup has announced shutting down due to financial difficulties and failed partnership talks. We have Samir who's joining in with all the reasons and some stats as well about the platform shutdown. Samir, tell us what the word coming in from the management is and what really are the reasons behind this. 
India's homegrown social media platform, which was once considered as an alternative to Twitter, as a main rival to Twitter, now X, the coup platform, it is going to discontinue its service. The announcement or the decision was announced by the founders, uh, Aparame, Radhakrishna, and Mank. They announced that uh, the yellow bird, it is finally saying a goodbye. The reason that they are discontinuing the discontinuing the service is because of the financial challenges. The note that was shared by the founders on the social media platform, it clearly mentioned that they were unable to secure fresh funds for the coup platform and that led to the harsh decision of discontinuing the coup platform for the public use. So they were not just the financial challenges but also because of the unpredictable market conditions. It was one of uh, the main reasons that the coup platform has finally been uh, shut down by the founders. The note also mentioned that for the last four months, the founders, they were in touch, they were in talks with multiple uh, people, they were in talks with multiple, uh, 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 you can call them as probable investors to, to secure fresh fronts. So they were in talks with the media companies, with the internet-based companies and several other conglomerates. But these talks did not yield a positive outcome for the coup platform and it did not... Uh, they were unable to secure fresh funds for the coup platform and finally they decided to shut down coup. So it is not uh, just the bad ending because there was a time when coup saw some glorious days as well. There was a time when the active users on the coup platform was, was very fascinating. The daily active users was somewhere around 2.1 million. On monthly basis, they registered an active user base of around 10 million. And more than 9,000 VIP uh, members were there on Coup platform. So yes, there was some glorious days for Coup platform. But uh, because of the financial challenges, now it has finally been decided by the founders to discontinue it for the public use. All right, let's move on then and talk about uh, some updates trickling in. Uh, and this is the update we got yesterday. Remember, earnings season just a week away for quarter one. And uh, this is Bajaj Finance that has come out with its update. And new loans booked have seen a 10% year-on-year increase coming in at 10.97 million compared to 9.94 million this time last year. Now, the company has resumed the sanction and dispersal of loans under uh, the e-com and Insta EMI card. And also, they've resumed the issuance of EMI cards after the RBI has removed the restrictions on these businesses on 2nd of May this year. Let's take a look at how the AUM has been doing and steady growth coming in across AUM as well because as of 30 June, you had AUM at 3.54 lakh crores, slightly above what the street was penciling in at 3.47 lakh crores. So, uh, good numbers coming in on the AUM front compared to 2.7 lakh crore at the close of last financial year, which is the growth, which is a growth of 31% on a year-on-year -year basis and quarter one AUM has also gone up by 23 uh, and a half thousand crore rupees. Now let's take a look at what the deposit book is looking like because steady growth is being penciled in over year as well. It's a 26% uptick coming in on a year on year basis at 62,750 crores versus 49,944 uh, crores at the end of uh, June in 2023. Now, lastly, let's also take a look at what the customer franchise a snapshot is looking like. Very decent growth coming in on this front as well, a 20.7% uptick on a year-on-year -year basis at the end of quarter one this year coming in at 88.1 million compared to at the end of quarter one last year at 72.98 million. And lastly, let's take a look at what the liquidity profile is looking like for the company. Net liquidity surplus has come in at roughly 16,200 crores as of the end of uh, quarter one. And the company's liquidity position looks strong is what the management has indicated. So overall, a very good set of uh, quarter one updates coming in for Bajaj Finance. All eyes will be on the results of this company on 23rd of this month. Well, absolutely. And then let's also uh, place the spotlight on banks with respect to their quarterly updates coming in as well, because they've started trickling in. And we have my colleague Gaurav who's standing by with the key updates. First, let's talk about Bandhan Bank because this bank has come up with a strong update for Q1. If we talk about advances, that has increased almost by 21.8%. And even if we look at sequential basis, it has increased almost by 0.7%. Now, let's not forget that Bandhan, in Bandhan Bank, there is a uh, there is a seasonality which hits in Q1. And that is why we have seen for the last three years that the sequential growth in at least Q1 FI25 was lower. But now, this time, bank has reported positive growth for sequential, uh, positive sequential growth in terms of advances. Even in terms of deposits, we have seen 22. 
8% growth in Bandhan Bank. This was largely led by bulk deposits. But there is another catch here that the CASA ratio has actually declined and even the CASA deposits has declined. So that has that is one thing that needs to be looked at. Let's if now talk about LCR ratio. That has also declined a little, but it is still at a healthy level of 149%. There are other factors for Bandhan Bank which will play out. The first one is asset quality because if you look at this quarter, collection efficiency has declined a little in terms of microfinance banking. There is another thing that needs to be looked at is as CGFMU claims, which could be a near-term catalyst for the stock. And lastly, RBI has recently hired additional director and that is another thing that needs to be looked at because Mr. C.H. Ghosh will retire on 9 July. Apart from that, let's also talk about Surya, the small finance bank, because this bank has also come up with strong updates when we talk about Q1. Now, advances have increased almost by 41.8%. Deposits have increased almost by 42.2% on a YY basis. And when we talk about gross NPS, that has also declined a little to 2.67% versus what it was at 2.8%. So again, a strong update coming up from the bank. Let's not forget that even in, a, in last quarter, the bank had reported almost more than 40% growth in terms of advances and deposits. And on back of this, we will definitely watch out for Surya Deva Small Finance Bank as well. All right, Gaurav, thanks for taking us through all of those banking updates coming in. But while you're with us and you've joined us this morning, take us through what stocks brokerages are flagging off and what's uh, made it to their era this morning. First, let's begin with Lupin because Kotex Securities has now upgraded the stock to add and also hiked the target price to 1805 rupees. What they believe is that the party for the stock will continue and we will see robust earning even from here on. And on back of this, we may see that uh, the, I mean, for Kotex, they have actually raised the EPS estimates almost by 3 to 16 percent. And this is on the back of the higher US sales that we may see in the company. And that is why they are being a little bullish on this company. Let's also now talk about LNT Finance because they have come up with the quarterly updates if you look at the growth retail disbursements have grown almost by 33 percent aum has grown almost by 31 percent on a yy basis and on back of this now city has maintained their buy rating with a target price of 221 rupees what they believe is that the share in retail aum that has increased to 95 percent which is a positive thing for uh, lnt finance and on back of this we may see core roa and roa growing further apart from that ubs has also maintained their buy rating with a target price of 230 rupees on this counter lastly let's also watch out for indigene because city has now initiated with sell rating and a target price of 510 rupees per share. What they believe is that the company is going to benefit from accelerated digitalization journey in the life science industry. Apart from that, they are also constructive on the business and they like the strong management that the company has. But when we talk about valuations, they are they are being a little bearish here. What they believe is that the current valuation appears to be priced in, in the uh, current market price and that is why they are being a little bearish with the stock price as well and that is why they have initiated with sell rating. So definitely watching out on all these counters on the back of brokerage notes. Absolutely, Gaurav. Thank you so much for that update coming in. So that is exactly what the brokerages are saying bright and early this morning. But time for a quick break. When we come back, we'll take a look at some more stock-specific news so you don't go anywhere. Hi there, welcome back. Still watching Market Cafe on ET. Now, let's keep it going with all the news that we are getting this morning. And SEBI has drastically reduced ticket size of the face value of debt securities from 1 lakh rupees to rupees 10,000. My colleague Ankur Mishra is joining us once again with more details on this. Ankur. Yes, in a bid to encourage the retail participation, uh, SEBI has now allowed the minimum ticket size of rupees 10,000 in debt securities. Uh, remember, the earlier minimum ticket size was rupees 1 lakh and uh, many market participants had reached out to regulator to reduce the ticket size because non-institutional participation was not there in the debt market. So now, a final circular from market regulator CB has come wherein uh, the face value of debt securities can be rupees 10,000 and uh, this was earlier rupees 1 lakh. Now how will it help investors? Uh, it is as easy as uh, uh, and any investor can invest from rupees 10,000 in debt securities whereby earlier requirement was rupees 1 lakh that is the minimum criteria now why uh, this application to CV was made uh, uh, remember uh, there as far as the debt uh, market is concerned uh, there was very less participation of uh, retail per se and that is the reason why regulator feels that the market was not growing and now uh, with decreasing the tick minimum ticket size of uh, uh, the debt securities to rupees 10,000, the expectation is that the non-retail, uh, the non-institutional investors will participate in the debt market and 
Therefore, this permission is finally given by the regulator. Remember, we at TT now had already reported about uh, SEBI considering about this move of reducing uh, uh, the minimum ticket size of debt securities. And finally, a circular from SEBI has been released uh, last night. All right, thanks Ankur yet again for that update coming in. So there you have it, that's the update coming in on the ticket size of uh, debt securities. But let's get a move on then and get the futures and options round up as well. We have Ansh who's standing by with just that. Ansh? Right, so let's start with what FIS did in the previous session. In index future, they added around 27,000 long contract. They covered around 4,000 short contract. With this, their net uh, long was up by around 31,800 contract. And the total long percentage rises at 83.6%, indicating very strong bullish stance in the market. Whereas if we check uh, retail traders, then they actually covered around almost around 6,000 contract on long side. And they added 20,000 short contract. So net to net, we are seeing addition of 26,000 contract on downside. So they are definitely getting very bearish in this market. But if you talk about Nifty, then in previous session we saw Nifty hitting that 24,300 for first time. Even Sensex got hit by that 80,000 level for the very first time. And all this rally was mainly led by HDFC Bank. Now we had actually spotted HDFC Bank's breakout on Tuesday itself just before the closing. And the same was continued on Wednesday. That's yesterday. Now if you talk about index options of Nifty, then today we have weekly option expiry. So we may see some volatility in the market. Here we are seeing that call buying is happening at 24,400 strike indicating traders expecting Nifty to go above this level whereas on downside we are seeing good put writing happening at 24,200 indicating good support around this level. If you talk about Nifty Bank then this index also touched record high and this was also mainly led by HDFC Bank and the key support here seems to be around 51,900 mark and uh, Nifty Bank is actually consolidating from last seven sessions keeping a neutral stance actually in the market but if you talk about index future then here we are seeing open interest has jumped by 13 percent indicating long buildup which is very strong bullish sign whereas in index option we are seeing mild put writing happening at 53,000 psychological mark indicating some support around this level lastly let's have a quick view on few fno stocks that are in focus and we are seeing significant long buildup happening in bhel pyramid enterprises and rbl bank where a short buildup for ashok leland titan and gujarat gas also in bandlist we are seeing hindustan copper and India cement. So keep an eye on the stocks. All right, Ansh, lots of stocks to watch out for and those are the key technical levels you need to keep in mind on the index today. But let's keep on going with a list of all the stocks that are going to be in focus. We have yet another basket of stocks to watch out for on the back of their individual news flows and Jinna is joining us with a list of just that. Good morning. So starting up with ITD Cementation, so Italian Thai Development, which is the promoter of the company, is looking and exploring uh, divestment in potential divestment into the company. And right now it is an early stage talk is what company is saying. Also keep your eyes on Kaya Limited and Merico. So Merico has been collaborating with Kaya to scale up advanced space science back personal care products for Kaya. And they will be aiming and they are aiming for an omni-channel presence for Kaya products range. Moving on, Brigade Enterprises will be in focus as the company will be developing an 8 acres land project in Bengaluru and the potential GDP for this project is 1100 crores. Next up GE TND India will be in focus. The company receives two orders. First order is from Grid Solutions Middle East. This is for 26 million euros and second order is from Grid Solutions France. This is worth around 64 million euros. Next up Cello will be in focus as the company launched its QIP yesterday and the floor price for this QIP is issued at 896 per equity share. Thanks, Tine, for that update coming in. Moving on, then Morgan Stanley has come up with some tactical ideas on FMCG. It maintains its equal weight stance on Titan, Britannia, as well as Dabur. An overweight stance coming in on Tata Consumer. Let's go across to my colleague Vinny, who's standing by with all the key takeaways. So absolutely, Morgan Stanley's tactical idea is what we are highlighting and in terms of Titan, uh, maintaining an equal rate rating target price of uh, 3,526 rupees, they believe that in the next 30 days, maybe we could see the share price of Titan fall. Uh, they believe that uh, what could come in is that if there's any bit of a disappointment that comes in terms of the earnings, especially from the jewelry division, uh, in the margins of the company, then that would be viewed quite negatively. Stock is trading at a 22% premium to its own historical average when you're looking at it the 10 year average so that is why any miss in terms of the number or a weaker product mix is what they are expecting this time in Q1 uh, higher intensity of exchange program consumer offers that they expect that to continue so that would be a bit of a negative for Titan uh, 
Tanya also is uh, they're maintaining an equal rate rating target price of 5021 rupees they believe that Britannia also is set to maybe fall relatively to the country's index that you look at it in the next 30 days they expect Britannia's company to deliver a 5% growth in terms of uh, revenue with a 7% volume growth is what they're expecting and when you're looking at it the stock is up almost 12% in the last three months so keeping an eye out on that while you've seen other peers in the FNB food and beverage side which have not seen much of a growth coming in Weakness in Q1 is what they are penciling in right now that could pose some uh, risk in terms of the move that we could see uh, for the stock going forward and they are expecting that that could be a reason why the underperformance would come in Britannia. Tata consumers on the other hand they are maintaining an overweight rating, they expect the stock price to rise in the uh, next 30 days versus the index that you could compare. They expect the company to deliver an improvement in terms of the organic top line growth, outperformance is expected from the st uh, stock given that the growth momentum they expect that to improve. So yes, keeping an eye out on that. Dabar, on the other hand, they expect this uh, also to see an um, rise coming in in the next 30 days in terms of the move. Uh, beverage portfolio is expected to do well. Overall, FMCG demand trends are similar to Q4, but they expect a strong seasonal demand coming in on a weak base for Dabar. And lastly, HUL, underweight rating is what they are maintaining. And they believe the share price will fall for HUL in the next 30 days versus the country index. And um, expect HUL to report um, a Subdued top line is what you could say and a bottom line growth, nothing exciting there. So yes, keeping an eye out on all these FMCG names. All right, Vinny, thanks for taking us through that. Uh, FMCG basket will be in focus on the back of that Morgan Stanley note coming in. But let's take it away from the markets and talk a little bit about general news. Veteran BJP leader Lal Krishna Adwani has been admitted to Apollo Hospital in Delhi. As per the hospital authorities, he has been kept under observation and his condition is stable. But remember, earlier last week, the 96-year-old leader was admitted to AIMS due to age-related health issues. Moving on, days after securing bail from the Charkhan High Court, Heman Soren is all set to return as Chief Minister of Charkhan. Soren was arrested by ED in an alleged money laundering scam and the JMM Congress RJD Alliance has elected Soren as the leader of the alliance, paving the way for his return to the top post. Moving on then, there's no stopping bridge collapses in Bihar as three more bridges have collapsed in the last 24 hours. So far, a total of nine bridges have collapsed in the state in just the last 15 days the state government has set up a panel to probe the collapses as well moving on then to the political landscape in the us amid reports that he was reconsidering running for the top post after his poor performance in the first presidential debate us president joe biden has voted to stay in the presidential race when asked about biden's withdrawal from the race the white house categorically denied any such possibility all right, that's a wrap on all the stories we were tracking for you from market close yesterday till bright and early this morning. Thanks so much for watching Market Cafe from Shreyansi, me and the entire team that uh, put this show together. Thanks for watching, but you stay tuned on the channel because the market takes all of the action ahead. If you like this video, then like, share and subscribe to ET Now.